Every modern intellectual has a romantic idea of science. Science is the cornerstone of modern thought. But does science have some flaws? Is science in practice different from science in theory? Do fundamental processes like peer review really guarantee good work? And do they really weed out bad thinking? These are the questions I'm trying to answer on the 64th episode of Patterson in Pursuit. Hello, my friends, and welcome to the 64th episode of Patterson in Pursuit. I have been playing up this episode for the last two weeks, and I guarantee it won't disappoint. This is, without a doubt, one of my favorite interviews so far. We are talking about the scientific process in practice as it is executed by tens of thousands of humans all across the world. As you guys know, I tend to be extremely skeptical of everything. But if you show any skepticism about the scientific process in practice, if you think maybe the academic system is not structured in such a way which preserves the ideals of the scientific method, you are immediately labeled as an anti-intellectual. Is there room for skepticism about science? I'd say, good heavens, yes, there is. If we care about the truth, we have to be honest about the challenges that the scientific and academic community faces. My guest this week is Mr. Brian Earp, who is the Associate Director of the Yale Hastings Program in Ethics and Health Policy at Yale University. He's also a research associate with the Oxford Center for Neuroethics, as well as being the author of my favorite article that I read this year called The Unbearable Asymmetry of Bullshit. I'll make sure to have a link to that in the show notes page this week, steve-patterson.com slash 64. But before we criticize the uncriticizable, I'm going to give a special shout out to all the supporters and listeners of this show. If you value the work that I'm producing, you enjoy the podcast Patterson in Pursuit, or you enjoy the articles or videos that I release, you can become a patron of the show, which means you contribute just a dollar or two every time a new article is released. Head over to patreon.com slash Steve Patterson, and you can join about 90 other patrons who are all chipping in to make this show possible. Plus, if you sign up, you'll get a free copy of both my books, What's the Big Deal About Bitcoin, and my first book on philosophy, Square One, The Foundations of Knowledge. So if you want this voice to be heard a little bit louder, then make sure to go to patreon.com slash Steve Patterson. All right, I hope you enjoy my conversation with Brian Earp. Mr. Brian Earp, thanks so much for coming on Patterson in Pursuit. It is a pleasure to have you on the show. I'm glad that we can talk today. Thanks for having me on. You wrote a fantastic article, which I read this year, though you published it last year, and it is my favorite article of the year. One of the listeners of this show shared it, um, and everybody who read it in our little online group just thought it was fantastic. So first of all, thank you for writing it. Um, I imagine you got some flack for it, is just my suspicion. But it's called The Unbearable Asymmetry of Bullshit. <laughs> and you get props uh, just for having a good and provocative title. But if I, I, I have to say, I was, yeah, I was pleased about the title. That's probably my favorite part. It's all downhill from there. After the title. <laughs> well, so you, like so many people in the 21st century, have a great deal of respect for science, the scientific method. But you say that there's a great quote in your article. In fact, I want to do this interview in a little bit different way that I usually do. I want to kind of go through it and then ask you questions about it. I'm not going to read through sure, the whole that's thing. Fine. I'm just going to pull, pull yeah. some remarks. You say, I still believe that the scientific method is the best available tool for getting at empirical truth. Or to put it slightly in a slightly different way, if I may paraphrase Winston Churchill's famous remark about democracy, it is perhaps the worst tool except for all the rest. In other words, science is flawed. So put a little meat on the bones there. What do you mean to say, first of all, that you think science is the best tool for getting at empirical truth, and yet you think it is flawed? Sure. There's a, a lot going on here. I'll, I'll quickly jump back to your, your speculation that maybe I received a lot of flack. It, surprisingly, I didn't. I received overwhelmingly positive uh, remarks from people across a whole range of disciplines. And Excellent. 
what I think part of that was about was that I had identified something within some of the areas that I specialize in that hasn't really been talked about before. And mm. I'm sure we'll get into what that is. This is sort of a way in which some people who have an agenda, uh, who you know, are scientists, practicing, practicing scientists, can sometimes contribute to the literature in a way that um, is not uh, uh, the most productive, it's not the most truth-bearing, and, uh, and I think people find that frustrating when you work in science and you're trying your best to, to get things right. You're trying your best to contribute to uh, uh, uncovering uh, what's really out there, and then you have people who have less concern for those goals, nevertheless participating in the conversation and mm. sometimes uh, uh, you know, uh, corrupting the literature with, with basically not good science. Mm. So um, it turns out this isn't just in the specific areas that I work in, but a lot of people are frustrated about, uh, frustrated about this. Mm. So this, this kind of leads me to answer your question about what do I say when I say, you know, science is, is the best method for getting at empirical truth, but uh, it, it's got these flaws and these difficulties that we have to face. Well, when I was a kid, I grew up thinking that you know, scientists were these uh, white lab coat wearing truth discoverers or something like that. And they were like demigods who just figured out what was right and were yeah. immune from the kinds of you know, human foibles that we're all uh, prone to. And then when I started training as a scientist, and particularly when I started studying the history and philosophy of science and the sociology of science, it became uh, obvious that scientists are whatever else they are, human beings with mm. psychological biases and career interests and things like that. Now, as I say in the article, most scientists that I know personally, and certainly the ones that I trust and work with, are, are hell-bent on getting things right. Nobody's trying to uh, you know, uh, uh, illegitimately get a, a paper published or something like that. But even if you're doing your best to get things right, there are aspects of the incentive structure of being a scientist. You have to constantly be publishing or you won't have a job. So sometimes you're overworked and you're uh, putting something into the literature that you wish you'd been able to spend more time on mm. and these sorts of things. So my general perspective is to, to kind of put this into a more concise uh, framework uh, scientists are humans. Scientists make mistakes. The current incentive structure of professional science, I think, is extremely problematic. And what this means is that although the scientific method, at least in an idealized form, uh, it is the best way of making sure that we don't fool ourselves, which I think is uh, Richard Feynman's famous statement, you know, the, it's easy to fool yourself, and scientists try really hard not to fool themselves. They want to really believe things that they only have good reason to believe. Mm. Uh, nevertheless, it's easy, it's easy to get fooled even when you're a, you know, a, a practicing scientist. And I think that being honest about that and uh, having a serious conversation about where the weaknesses are in science will um, allow scientists and funders and policymakers and so on to uh, put in place the sorts of structures that will further limit these kinds of uh, human biases that detract from the best work that scientists are otherwise capable of doing. I think uh, hiding from that and pretending that you know, you're either pro-science or anti-science mm. is such a simplified and, and frankly stupid dichotomy mm. that uh, it's so frustrating to see circling around the internet whenever there is a debate that comes up. That's an excellent point. The way that I like to talk about this is between science in theory which is, as you say, how we kind of think of the scientists in the lab coats that are all getting at truth, versus science in practice, which is a bunch of humans who are not categorically superior to every other human on the planet going about a very difficult craft. So that, yeah, I think you put it in an excellent way. But I want to focus on one aspect that you mentioned, which is the incentive structure in the, the world of science in practice. So you've got a line here in your article, you say, if the scientists want to keep their jobs, at least they must contend with a perverse publish or perish incentive structure that tends to reward flashy findings and high volume productivity over painstaking, reliable research. Can you explain? Yeah. Um, the physicist uh, Peter Higgs, who was responsible for coming up with uh, the idea about the Higgs boson, which is this just fundamental aspect of reality, one of the most important uh, uh, theories and discoveries in, in physics, uh, commented that if he were up for tenure today, he probably wouldn't get a job. Now, he, I, he won the Nobel Prize, unless I'm getting this wrong. Uh, I'm almost certain that he did. We can Google it. Uh, but um, the, the point there is that it took him a long time to sit there and think, and he came out with a paper every once in a while when he really was sure of what he was saying. Mm. Um, and, you know, he had a secure academic job, and that's sort of the way that the uh, incentive structure was, was set up around the time. Uh, nowadays, his point is that you can't get a job unless you have this consistent flow of papers coming out. Now, there's different reasons for why that's come about. Some people tie it to the what they call the corporatization of universities. Universities are basically turning themselves into businesses with paying customers, which are their students. Mm. Um, and, you know, in order for people to run their labs, they have to get funding. 
funders want to see that you're being productive. You're not just going to waste their money. So you, you, know, you don't want to be just sitting around in the lab. And so all these pressures are combining to make it the case that, um, again, scientists, not just to be uh, accepted by their peers or do a slightly better job, but simply to get a job at all have to do a certain amount of intensive publishing from the moment the clock starts after they receive their PhD. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't fault scientists for this. Again, I, I think some people think, well, you know, it's really up to the scientists to make sure that they're keeping their uh, integrity up to the, the top level it could possibly be, and they shouldn't be publishing so much stuff if they're not able to do a good job uh, with each paper. But that's not really the choice they face. It's not doing a little bit less publishing and slightly better work or something like that. It's that if you don't keep up with the rat race, you, you won't work in science at all. You're mm -hmm. going to have to get a different job altogether. So I think these pressures really need to be dealt with and, and look at the s systemic uh, contextual issues that are driving scientists into this, this frenzy of, uh, of, of uh, you know, mass-produced work. And, um, and sometimes that leads to shortcuts. Sometimes mm -hmm. that leads to, um, you know, collaborating on a paper where you haven't really, you're not sure what, where the data came from, but you know that your colleague did it. And, you know, these kinds of little things that wouldn't happen if there was more breathing room, more time, and less pressure. Right. And this, this is such an important point. And maybe we'll talk about it a little later, but it also relates to the replication crisis um, that right. at least we've seen in the realm of psychology. Is I think the the area that's been affected most by it, where even the material that gets published in the peer-reviewed journals that people are are putting out there, responding to these career incentives, can't isn't even necessarily good science in 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 quotes. Right? Yeah, well, partly, partly there's a number of factors that, that play into this issue, and I think it's a very serious concern. There's some debate among scientists about how, how much of a, of a crisis or not we're really in. Some scientists say, well, of course, a lot of work that's published shouldn't replicate later because that's the cost of doing innovative stuff. You know, if you put an idea out there, sometimes it's not going to hold up over time, but you don't want to just do bricklaying exercises for for all of science where all you're doing is, is, you know, hardly moving anything forward, never being innovative, never being creative, you know, mathematically proving everything before you're, you, you put an idea out there. And I think that that's right. We have to have a serious debate about what the, as it were, correct replication rate should be. It shouldn't be 100% because that means science would be moving far too slowly mm. and there would be no innovation. Um, it probably shouldn't be 0%. Maybe 50% <laughs> is right. It's hard to say. But there's a prior discussion that, that has to be had about what, what we want in terms of trade-offs between innovation, creativity, and, you know, painstaking care and replication and, and so on. Um, but, but certainly there are many people who are concerned, and I'm one of them, that the, these incentives I've been talking about make it more likely that the work that does get published is essentially uh, statistical errors or false alarms. And I'll mm -hmm. just give you a few examples of how this can happen. Mm -hmm. So imagine that you have 20 laboratories basically running the same experiment. And this, this is not an unrealistic expectation. If you have uh, a bunch of people who are closely following a literature, sometimes there's a sort of obvious next step that you would do. And so you might have a bunch of different laboratories running essentially a similar experiment. Uh, now, if, if, if none of them get it to work, except for one of them, uh, that one person, and, and in this case, we're pretty sure this is a, a statistical fluke. If it worked one time out of 20, that's basically as a, a guarantee that it's an error. Mm -hmm. um, that person will say, oh, look, I found something, and they'll submit it, and they'll get it published in a journal because they met the sort of threshold criterion for publication, which mm -hmm. is these so-called statistically significant findings. There's a whole debate about that that we can get into. Mm -hmm. Um, but you don't hear about these other labs that didn't get it to work because for the longest time, journals had a very strong prejudice, and they still do, against publishing so-called negative results or null findings. Right. And what that means is that the one time it quote-unquote worked, which is an error, gets published, and the 19 times it didn't work, nobody knows about mm -hmm. uh, because they're not published anywhere. This it just exists in, in people's so-called file drawer. So this is called the file drawer problem. The scientist runs a study. It doesn't seem to work. They just file it away, and they don't bother to write it up anywhere. Mm -hmm. What happens, though, is that you're at a conference with your colleagues, and you might be sitting at the bar afterwards, and uh, somebody from another lab says, oh, yeah, I tried to work on that study, and, you know, I just couldn't get that result to replicate. And so you says, yeah, you know, I, I, I did too. And so you have this informal knowledge going around among scientists that a lot of stuff can't really be repeated or that probably isn't trustworthy uh, stuff, but all that's in the public record is, is, is what's likely to be a, a mm. false alarm. So that's that's one way you can get the uh, you know these sorts of replicability problems. Now, from the outside, that 
seems like that is a really big deal, that that is a, like a methodological issue, because then you have the literature being built on top of literature that actually gets published, but that the fundamental, you know, the seminal works here are perhaps flawed themselves. So when you say, yeah, yeah go ahead. Well, I'll, I'll just add one quick thing to that. So um, let's say that you publish something in, in a top journal, you know, science magazine or psychological science or something like that if we, want, if we want to focus on psychology. And I just want to be fair to psychology. Psychology's been in the spotlight, but these problems are rippling through biomedicine, uh, biology, mm -hmm. neuroscience, genetics, and other areas. So uh, psychology sort of taken the, the brunt and, and actually is leading innovations to try to address these problems. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I myself trained in psychology, so I know this area best, and that's, that's why I'll, I'll use these examples. But uh, let's say that you've got a, a paper published in the top journal. Well, uh, supposedly, if you go back to Francis Bacon, the idea about what makes science different from pseudoscience is that you have these intersubjectively verifiable observations. Mm -hmm. that if you report that you could do something in your lab, I should be able to do the same thing in my lab. And so essentially people are supposed to check each other's work. Mm -hmm. But the problem is from the professionalization of science where it becomes you have to you know, keep up with a career to keep your job. It's not in anyone's individual career interest to do an exact copy of anyone else's study. So mm -hmm. if you publish something, I now I'm going to move away from that area because I figure, okay, well, you've got that cornered, and I have to come up with my own sexy finding to advance my own career interest and get my own grants and get my own prestige. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not going to do an exact copy of your work. The closest thing I'll do is what's called a conceptual replication. And what this means is I take your finding for granted because there it was published in a top <laughs> journal, and then I try to sort of – test it a slightly different way, using slightly different methods, or I'll try to extend the idea into a new territory, basically build on your work. Well, here's the problem. If I use slightly different methods than you used, and I don't get the effect that I expected to get, I don't know where to place the blame. I could just say to myself, mm -hmm. well, it's because I changed something. So whatever I changed is probably responsible for my failure to find the effect. Mm -hmm. So these so-called conceptual replications, if they, if they turn out, if they work, then they get published, and it looks like, oh, the original finding is supported, and now it has further support for it. And so just as you say, and this is, the, this is why I wanted to jump in there, when you say you're building literatures on top of literatures on top of literatures where it might be false findings all the way down, this sort of thing can happen because people aren't doing what are called direct or exact replications. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, they make some sort of change because they don't want to just do an exact copy. That's seen as very unprestigious. It's uh, you know, sort of looked down upon typically. And so when nobody's doing an exact replication, when they're, when they're changing something, and it doesn't work out, they don't know where to place the blame, so they just say, well, it's probably my fault, and they don't tell anyone about mm. it. And if they get it to work, it gets in the literature. So you get this sort of um, you know, self-reinforcing cycle of, uh, of, of apparently building and advancing on, on certain theories when the bulk of it might very well just be these flukes that we were talking about earlier. Mm. Now, I want to ask you a couple questions on that. When, when, when you describe that phenomenon, just in your, I mean, in your professional estimation, this is, uh, I'm asking you an impossible question that you're not going to be able to answer, but I'm still going to ask it anyway. Sure. Do you have any inclination for what the absolute amount is of this kind of, let's say, foundationally flawed literature, at least in psychology, because that's your, your area of expertise? Is this something that we're talking about is, okay, you know, we need to bring it up because it's 10% around the edges, or is this something that you think is deeply throughout the literature? Well, yeah, yeah, there's a couple ways of getting in that. The, there's a very famous paper that was published in 2005 by a Stanford uh, sort of epidemiologist and now meta scientist named John Ioannidis, and, uh, or maybe it's Ioannidis, I realize I should figure out how to pronounce his name. Uh, he, he published a paper called Why Most Published Research Findings Are False. Mm -hmm. And he basically uh, took account of all these different nudge factors that make it likely that uh, false alarms do get published, certainly more than they should, and did some modeling and so on and sampled lots of papers. And he came up with this estimate based on a, a more or less a, a rigorous way of coming up with the estimate. Uh, certainly uh, there are some critics of it, where he thinks that it's more than 50% of what's published in biomedicine is, is simply f false, just wow. not true. It says there's a finding, but that there's nothing there, nothing to see there. So that's his estimation. Now, in psychology, famously recently, there was a big uh, exercise uh, called the uh, Open Science Collaboration got together, and they sampled 100 papers from the top, some top journals in psychology, and they had uh, independent labs try to replicate each of those studies one more time. And uh, there's various ways of measuring what counts as a replication, but on, on all the metrics they used, it was not very promising. Uh, it was 
uh, you know, in uh, you know, 37 percent of the, the the papers replicated on some metrics, uh, a little bit more, a little bit less, depending on how you uh, count replication. That, by the way, is a very on a hot debate. Uh, what, what does it mean to replicate a finding? Does mm-hmm. it mean that you get the exact same effect size? Does it mean you get the exact same p-value if you're using frequentist statistics? Mm-hmm. Well, not necessarily. That, that's not necessarily the, the most obvious way of saying that you've repeated the same finding. So mm-hmm. I just want to flag here for, for putting in people's minds in the background that this is where philosophy of science comes in. Mm-hmm. What counts as as a successful replication, how close do you have to be to the mark to say, yeah, that seems like that is supportive of the original finding, or that's different enough that we should sort of subjectively call this a non-replication. Mm. Uh, so that's that's part of the debate here. But to, to tie those strands together, I would not be surprised if uh, 50% or more of uh, published findings, including in top journals, uh, is, is merely statistical noise. Mm. Now, for me, not, I'm not, not a professional scientist here, when you've got 50% of a product that might be statistical noise, as you put it, that that is like a, a paradigm-shattering idea to entertain, I think, for lots of people. Um, what it sounds like, what it sounds like, is that you used an interesting term I, I want to ask you about, <clears throat> the professionalization of science. It sounds like there are potentially gigantic gigantic flaws, which might be able to be corrected here uh, in the area of let's, academia in general and the, in the incentive structure of this scientific um, system. But it's almost like there's no time for anybody to correct the systemic flaws because they don't have the career incentives to do so. And in fact, if they don't just accept the structure as it is, they might not even have a job in the future. Is that is? Do you get the same sense that that's kind of what's going on? Yes, I think that's right. I was uh, at a meeting uh, at the Royal Dutch uh, Academy of Sciences um, a couple of months ago, and the the Dutch government had um, taken interest in this issue. I think precisely because they realized that it's not going to be something where individual scientists can stick out their neck and somehow heroically save the system. Mm. It's uh, what's sometimes referred to as a collective action problem. It's not mm. in my interest to slow down and try to get everything right mm-hmm. and publish you know, only one paper every three years once I've built up a, a body of evidence because, like I say, I just simply won't have a job if mm-hmm. I do that. So I, 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 in fact, can't stick out my neck and still be a scientist. Uh, that's you know in some cases maybe you can if people have tenure and big grants and so on and they have a reputation maybe they can take a, a little bit more of a make a little bit more of a change but mm-hmm. a lot of people particularly early career scientists simply cannot afford to uh, work against the incentive structure so what that means is the incentive structure must change and I think that that's going to come down to funders governments uh, and other sort of uh, you know systemic um, uh, forces or, or uh, to, to make these changes. If if there's going to be the kind of proper response to the amount of, you know, frankly wasted resources, mm. there's also ethical implications to this. If you look at medicine, you know, and you enroll mm. people in a, a medical trial, for example, and you're not you don't have the utmost care about what statistical analyses you're going to use, which control conditions you're going to use, whether you publish all of the trials. I mean, this is something you see with drug companies. Drug companies run lots of trials on drugs, and they don't publish all of the ones that they ran. They publish mm-hmm. the ones that make the drug look good. Mm-hmm. That's, a, that's a huge ethical concern, because now you're, you're subjecting human beings to risks without having done due diligence and making sure that you're going to you know, have the very best estimate of what's true about that substance or that intervention um, that's uh, that's ethically unacceptable. So there's wasted resources, there's human costs, there's uh, all sorts of problems, and, and I do think it's a big problem, but the solution is not going to be individual scientists trying to be heroes. Mm. Um, it's going to have to be systemic changes to the reward structure and to publication practices. Now, do you have, are you optimistic about the prospects for that kind of systemic uh, incentive structure change that doesn't come from renegade scientists, let's say? Uh, I think there's a sort of generational shift going on here, and I don't want to be too um, broad-brushed with this. There's there's people at every stage of their career who think that this is a, a serious crisis and needs to be addressed, and others who think that the, the talk of crisis is, is being overblown. So uh, there's, but but if I had to sort of just give you my estimation, looking at the literature and talking to people and getting a sense of what's going on, I get the sense that scientists were sort of uh, you know, coming up and forming the next generation of researchers are are really taking this seriously, are concerned about getting it right, don't want to just churn out publications that they don't know whether they're they're accurate or not. They're they're trying to learn new statistical tools. So 
another thing that I, I planted a flag in before is there's this common procedure used in psychology, but also biology and neuroscience called the null hypothesis significance testing. And this is basically a, a common statistical inferential procedure that for decades, uh, statisticians have been have been shouting at the social scientists and the medical scientists saying, actually, this procedure is not valid as an inference procedure in the way mm. that you're using it. It only gives you useful information under very strict conditions that almost never hold in uh, the, uh, the experimental conditions that um, psychologists and uh, 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 medical researchers use. And so, you know, but that's the thing that journals got used to accepting as the valid form of statistics. And so you get this sort of institutional inertia where you use these basically statistical rituals to get p-values less than 05. And then if it's less than 05, you say, well, um, uh, we, we've got a publication. So there are, there's a growing movement now of people who say, listen, this is just – we can't keep using these statistics in this – in this uh, mechanical way, we need to actually have serious proper training in statistics and look at Bayesian methods and other, other forms of doing statistics hmm. and have statistical controls on institutional review boards and embedded in every lab and in every department so you don't have people who aren't truly experts in statistics just cranking out these studies. Mm-hmm. Um, I see a groundswell support for these kinds of changes uh, that, that seems to be coming up from, from roughly speaking, younger scientists. So mm-hmm. I, I am optimistic that, uh, that there's a possibility for change. And I think that, you know, funders and governments are, are getting on board. I do want to raise a risk here, of course. I saw an article uh, recently pointing out that um, folks on the right-hand side of the political spectrum who, you know, are skeptical, let's say, or doubtful about, say, climate science or, um, uh, you know, vaccinations, these kinds of things, will find an easy opportunity to kind of seize on this, this what to me is a, is a very healthy and important discussion happening within science and, you know, with the media attention that's happening in the public domain as well, that science is not just this record of facts that get published. You know, a paper isn't just a thing that's now true. It's mm. more of a progress report. It says this is what we think is probably true now, or this is a finding, but it has limitations, and we're going to have to wait to see if it replicates. So I think the public needs to understand, you know, science needs to stop – suggesting that every time a paper is published, it's this earth-shattering new discovery. Mm-hmm. Science moves very, very slowly. Replications take a long time to do. Um, science clearly in some instances works. You know, We really did send a rocket to the moon. There really are diseases that have been eradicated. So it's not that science is, is just um, alchemy or something like that. There, there is, there's good science out there, but it takes a long time to get the kind of confidence that you need. There are better and worse scientists. There are scientists who are more and less careful. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, uh, what the public shouldn't do is just say, well, given that there are these various flaws in science, that it's not a perfect enterprise, you know, my opinion is just as good as any scientist. Mm. That's not really the way to go on this either. That's why I try to chart a middle course. I say science really is the best way of answering these questions. It's certainly better than the opinion on the street, uh, that's not a reliable way of getting at, you know, complicated truths about what's going on with, say, the atmosphere. Um, that doesn't mean that the science about uh, the climate is, is infallible or that every study that's been published is, is uh, you know, uh, gospel truth. But that is the best way we have of actually answering these very difficult questions. And uh, so we have, to, we have to both allow for flaws and faults in science, that it's an imperfect enterprise that's doing its best to, to uh, uh, you know, get an accurate picture of the world. Um, but then we also need to, on, on the other hand, not uh, uh, therefore throw out the baby with the bathwater mm-hmm. and say, well, I guess we just don't know anything, and whatever my untutored opinion is on any subject is as, as good as any experts. Um, that's that's uh, totally misguided as well. And I, I, one factor in this um, is I wonder what role the media in particular and journalists play in the, yeah. um, let's say, over-hyping, perhaps, uh, or premature hyping of scientific findings. So one of the questions I wanted to ask you was, um, do you think the, the current, I'm comfortable calling it a crisis, a foundational epistemological crisis in uh, science, do you think this is a, a new occurrence based on the relatively modern system of academia, maybe in the past 100 years or even 60 years? Um, because another variable in this is, like I said, uh, media journalistic coverage of the latest study that came out that now gets overblown, and that particular you know scientist probably has a lot more prestige and maybe a lot more funding if they publish something in a prestigious journal and it catches news headlines, which uh, seem to greatly distort and misunderstand various facts that are presented in scientific literature. Do you think this is relatively new 
So I, uh, I raised this point in some lectures I gave, which is that uh, if you look at the historical record, crises of one sort or another have been declared pretty regularly since the founding of psychology. Uh, and in other disciplines, if you go back even further before psychology was sort of recognizable as a discipline in its own right, you have you know enormous debates about whether this finding or that finding is reliable or this theory or that theory. I mean, just think of the amount of time Darwin spent working on the theory of evolution and wasn't willing to publish his results until uh, you know Wallace came out and said, I, I found something similar. Hmm. So uh, these kinds of crises and debates and politicization of science has been going on forever. In fact, in the 1970s, uh, if you look at the, the titles of journal articles in psychology, the leading journals, they have titles like The Crisis of Confidence in Social Psychology. Hmm. Now, why, was, why didn't nobody hear about that? I think it's because there wasn't the internet around, mm. and there weren't blogs, and there wasn't a 24-hour news cycle where people were trying to take every bit of thing that looks like news and then turn it into a public discussion. Mm -hmm. So um, what's happened now is the same sort of problems that certain critics within psychology had been raising for decades have just become much more public and embarrassing. Mm -hmm. So if you go back and look at the work of a uh, psychologist, Jacob Cohen, from the, from the 60s, he has papers pointing out, there's a, I think it's his paper, it might be someone else's, but it's, he says, God loves the 0.06 just as much as the 0.05, you know, making the point that <laughs> this obsessive uh, uh, concern uh, with this essentially arbitrary cutoff point, it could have been something different, it just became ossified as the convention in the field, hmm. that ba basically people stopped thinking in sophisticated ways statistically, and they started thinking in routinized, ritualized ways. Hmm. And these critiques had been raised for a long time. Uh, Anthony Greenwald, the famous hmm. psychologist, wrote a paper in the early 70s called uh, Unintended Consequences of Prejudice Against the Null. Basically, he was talking about the file drawer problem or mm. publication bias where journals weren't accepting negative findings and, and saying, this is this is really bad. Uh, we have a very skewed literature, and even our meta-analyses aren't going to be reliable because we're only doing a meta-analysis of what was published, but what was published is not representative of what was conducted. Mm. So uh, these, these critiques have been around forever. Um, just to put a personal bent on this, my, my grandfather, who I never met, who died in the 1940s, uh, wrote a paper in 1927 in uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association called The Need to Publish Negative Results. And his mm. point was, wow. if you only publish the successes, you're going to have a very skewed sense of what's reliable. If, if all the failures are, are never published, then you know the published record is not an indication of what we really know. Um, and I stumbled across this paper as I was doing this research, and I, I had chills down my spine that uh, somebody I never met but was related to had indeed been talking about this as early as 1927. So Now, when that's in 1927, that's nearly a century ago um yeah that's you still think though that there is um hope for change in that particular regard because that i had no idea that 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 was it went that far back um these kind of problems i think i think in a way the public attention that's been drawn to these problems um is part of what's going to lead to a more serious effort to try to find solutions. Uh, these were just internal professional debates that were mm -hmm. happening as, as recently as the 1970s in, in social psychology when these kinds of papers were being published. And, you know, there was lots of, uh, uh, you know, um, people being concerned and scratching their foreheads and thinking maybe we should change our methods. And then nothing really came of it. Uh, and people just kept, you know, pursuing the same kinds of uh, practices that, you know, reliably led to publications, which led to esteem from their colleagues, which led to good careers and so on. And, mm. and there were always people working to be hardcore in their methodology and say, you really, uh, you know, it's harder to show something than you think it is, or you really need to replicate this before you put it out in the public or whatever. Um, but, but those folks didn't have, uh, you know, as much influence over the field as they really should have, partly because it's not sexy to talk about methodology. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's really boring and it's really hard. You know, to figure out, for example, what counts as a measurement, this is an is issue in, in psychology. How do you measure a mental state? Well, psychology really likes to use numbered scales, uh, mm -hmm. you know, one to seven. Give me your answer on this thing. And I'll, I'll just give you one, one example of how this is problematic. So let's say you have a, a scale and you want to measure whether people are, are more liberal or more conservative. And a, a standard way of doing this is just a one-item measure where you say, you know, one equals very conservative and seven equals very liberal. Mm -hmm. And people just mark, mark where they are on the scale. Now, in order to do the standard statistics on the scale, certain things have to be true of the scale in terms of its ability to measure whatever is out there, this actual you know, tendency to be more liberal or conservative. And one thing that has to be true is that the difference between a 1 and a 2 on the scale has to be the same as the difference between a 6 and a 7. Mm. It has to be measuring the same kind of mental tendency or political mm -hmm. tendency out there. 
The problem is that's not re- that's not really the case. Very few people are willing to put themselves on the extreme ends of the scale because mm. saying I'm a one or a seven is really a strong statement. Right. So most people put themselves somewhere in the middle of the scale, and that means that if you do put yourself on a one or a seven, you're actually way far out there in terms of your your political tendencies, at least in terms of your self-identification. Mm-hmm. And what this means is it's not it's the scale is not mapping on in a one-to-one relationship with the phenomenon out there. Right. Um, you know, however you want to conceptualize it. And so most of the statistical tests you would use on this scale are, are invalid from the start. Um, but, you know, to, to work out how you do a valid measurement of a mental state or a political disposition or something like that is an extraordinarily complex mm-hmm. epistemological problem. And it's, it's simply kind of boring for, for a lot of people who work in the field. So they, they're kind of happy to use numbered scales without really interrogating what would have to be true of this scale for the statistics I'm using on it to be valid statistics. Um, there are some people who work on that, but they publish in obscure journals. Now, that this just to me sounds like pure philosophy. It sounds like all what you're talking about is just really epistemology. Um, you know, what would have to be true in order for this to be true and this to be a reliable method, which I think is wonderful. I think these questions are of the utmost importance. Maybe that's why I'm, I'm biased yeah. here because I find like that you have to have it almost seems like you should have these discussions before even undertaking the projects. But when you say that, um, the, the example with the, the numbered scale, there's also the question of the relationship between self-reported political beliefs and what you, if somehow you could measure actual political beliefs. So somebody might consider themselves, you know, a three, but actually in practice they support, you know, policies that, are, that would be uh, more liberal. You know, how do you measure something like that? Right. I mean, psychologists have been aware for a long time of the problems of self-report. Um, there are many of them. One is that people often don't know their own minds. Another is that people are often motivated to uh, respond in ways that they think the experimenter wants them to respond. This mm-hmm. is called socially desirable responding. And there are various methods that have been proposed to try to account for these kinds of things, but they, they aren't always employed. So, um, you know, I've written a critique of a study uh, in, a, in a medical journal. Uh, where uh, they asked questions in such a way that it was almost like like leading the witness, and then they got mm-hmm. the answers that they expected, and they had no measure or even attempt to assess, are these participants giving answers that we want to hear? And if you mm-hmm. don't account for that, the answer doesn't mean anything at all. It just mm-hmm. means that they told you what you wanted to hear. That's not a reliable measure of their actual mental state. Right. And so uh, you know, even, even the measures that have been uh, invented are kind of uh, in, imperfect, um, I'll just tell you one of them as an example. So uh, there are these socially desirable responding measures that basically give people a set of questions where it's very unlikely that that uh, a certain answer is true, but it's the socially desirable answer. Mm-hmm. And so if a person consistently gives the socially desirable answer that just very has a very low base rate possibility that that's the case, either they're an extraordinary person in this regard, and you just have a sample full of extraordinary people, which which is unlikely, or people are showing a tendency to respond in the way that they think you want them to. Right. And when when that's true, you can identify those people who have that tendency, and you can you know compensate for the, their effect on on uh, whatever it is that you're investigating. Mm. So these are the sorts of tools that have been developed, and when they are employed, I think that's very good. But certainly, psychologists are aware of self-report problems, but they're hard to get around, um, mm. uh, no matter which way you you try. So I I want to go. We're running out of time a little bit here. I want to go back um, just for a bit to two more sections in your article, some things I want to talk to you about. So you've got a line in here where you're talking about the humanness of scientists, you say. Uh, They have reputations to defend, egos to protect, and grants to pursue. They get tired. They get overwhelmed. Then you say they don't always check their references or even read what they cite. That seems right. like an uh, uh, outrageous claim. What, what do you mean by that? Well, there's been interesting documentations of this. Uh, I, uh, there's a, something about, what is it? It's an urban legend about whether spinach has a lot of iron in it or something like that. Mm. There's a wonderful sort of sociology of science piece uh, that uh, I can't remember the author's name off the top of my head. But he, he basically shows that um, people rely on trust a lot in science. So if somebody that I trust cited something in support of some claim, I'm not necessarily going to go try to dig up the original article. Maybe it's hard for me to find. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's in some obscure journal or something like that. But I don't want to just cite a secondary source. So what I'll do is I'll I'll cite the original source cited by the other person, even if I maybe haven't read it. Now, mm-hmm. I'm not saying this of myself, but I'm saying this as an example of the sort of thing that sometimes happens where um, – uh, you, you know, you make these inferences where tracking down the original source and confirming that it really is that way 
um, is sometimes incredibly time consuming. And mm-hmm. so in order to kind of get the point across, you might use a heuristic that is, you know, may typically be reliable. It might very well be the case that such and so a researcher tends to do a really good job and you know that if they cited something, that's probably a good citation and so on. But this is just to give an example of, of the sort of scenario where someone might uh, include a, a reference to support a claim that mm-hmm. isn't really the best uh, way of supporting the claim or maybe they haven't scrutinized that paper. Um, I, I'll, I'll give you an example that, that kind of shocked me. So um, the Centers for Disease Control came out with a policy on a, on a very controversial issue, which is infant male circumcision, which mm-hmm. happens to be an area I know a lot about. And uh, they they came out with this policy. It's much fanfare. It was a draft, but nevertheless, it was picked up by all the media. And you know, this is the new policy from the CDC, which is supposed to be the you know most scientifically respected respected medical uh, body out there. Mm-hmm. Well, I uh, this happens to be an area of expertise of mine, so I went and read the policy, all however many pages of it, and I noticed that there were these these just stunning errors in citation. Uh, I'll give one example to mm-hmm. illustrate, and uh, there are others I could raise. So here's one. They say. Um, uh, according to this study, only 6.5% of infants experience clinically significant pain when they undergo this procedure. Now, I thought, well, I haven't heard that figure before, so let me go look up their reference. So I dig up their reference, and there is a 6.5%, but it, it's a misprint, and it only appears in the abstract of the paper. It's nowhere in the body of the paper because it was just a typo. And so what that means is you know right away that the researchers at the CDC did not read the paper. They right. only read the abstract, right. and they cited what's in their abstract. Now, I knew as an undergraduate student, if you're going to cite something, you should read the whole paper, and you shouldn't just take it at face value. You know, authors often spin their work, or they try to make the abstract sound really cool and advanced, even though it goes a little bit beyond what's actually shown in the paper. They certainly don't highlight the limitations in the abstract, you know, and this is why when you get media reports, the media reports often go with the abstract or the press release or something like that, mm-hmm. including the New York Times, by the way. This is a whole story. Uh, of its own. Uh, the New York mm-hmm. Times science reporter, uh, this one guy, Nicholas Bacalar, I, on so many occasions, I see him just basically repeat the content of press releases without getting any critical opinion from somebody who disagrees with the view of those authors, without mm-hmm. scrutinizing the study itself to see whether there may have been flaws or limitations in it. And if this is science journalism, I, 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 I despair, because the New York <laughs> Times, if something comes out on those pages, people figure that's as good as true. Mm-hmm. But if, if it's really just a, a, a recycling of a press release, I mean, I, I don't know how deep this problem runs because, again, I only have a couple of areas that I'm, uh, you know, familiar enough with the literature to be able to identify these problems. Mm-hmm. But in the areas that I know, it happens all the time. So uh, to go to go back to my my uh, paper uh, that I was looking at. Uh, the, the figure that was probably they meant to cite was 6.7%, which isn't very different, but that turns out that was miscalculated in that table, and it should be 7.3%. So still, that's not in, terribly different, but the point is you just know that they didn't read the paper carefully. Mm-hmm. And then the takeaway lesson was that something like 75% of the infants experience clinically significant pain just being administered the anesthetic. And so to say that 6.5% experience clinically significant pain when upwards of 70% experience clinically significant pain just by, you know, getting the anesthetic, and then that has a failure rate of over 7%, is to completely misrepresent the content of the paper they were citing. Yeah. And this is the Centers for Disease Control. And I could, I could spell out many other examples like this. So, so if even the folks at the Centers for Disease Control can make undergraduate-level research errors, again, I don't know how widespread this problem is. Uh, I hope it doesn't happen all the time. I hope it doesn't happen uh, as frequently in areas that I'm not uh, familiar with. But I I honestly don't know. And I've seen this sort of thing play out with, you know, supposedly respectable policies from mainstream institutions and the World Health Organization. Uh, I've scrutinized some of their policies and seen similar uh, uh, basic level errors. And uh, it was was very disheartening and disturbing when I noticed that uh, this was taking place. Now, I mean, there's so much to talk about there. I would love, I would love to hear some of these other examples. When you say the CDC, now, is that because I don't know how these institutions work? Is that literally this a, a gr- group of scientists themselves, practicing scientists, that are putting out this work, or is this kind of some group of bureaucrats that are trying to do some kind of meta study that maybe they don't actually know what they're talking about? Right. So. Um... At the CDC, it's, uh, the authors of that particular report were anonymous, which is interesting. Now, mm-hmm. I, I expect that at the CDC, it's mostly scientists doing these so-called technical reports. Now, maybe they have orders from bureaucrats who sort of have a, you know, a, a certain outcome they expect or something like that. 
But often what happens is, so this particular literature I'm talking about, the literature on circumcision, is very polarized and politicized. Mm -hmm. There are people who have very strong feelings on either way, and some of the scientists who are contributing to the literature themselves have very strong feelings or biases one way or the other. Mm -hmm. And so unless you're an expert in this specific literature, it's not enough to be an epidemiologist. It's not enough to be a pediatrician or a urologist, generally speaking. You have to actually be an expert in this specific literature because otherwise you can't account for the political games that are being played between different scientists, you know, citing their friends' articles, and citing their own articles in a way that's not really representative of what other people would say. These kinds of things happen when you have a politicized literature. Uh, this is one area, but there are many examples of this, mm -hmm. where scientists uh, sometimes polarize over, over whether they think a treatment works or doesn't work or whatever it is. So in this case, my, my, my sort of charitable assumption is that they had a group of scientists who are generally knowledgeable about the sorts of things that are typically relevant to these kinds of policies, but who weren't experts in the specific literature. And, mm. they, and they clearly couldn't have been because, for example, they prominently cited the work of, a, of an Australian researcher that nobody in this area takes seriously mm. uh, for, for, for a core claim. And you could only do that if you don't know the literature, because mm. if you do, you would never cite this guy's work, certainly not in a, a government policy. Mm. So that's, that's my guess about what was happening there. In the case of the World Health Organization, um, uh, I've uh, looked at a, a policy of theirs. I think in that case, it depends. Some, sometimes you have scientists who are writing the policy. Other times you have sort of kind of researcher, worker, bureaucrats who have consultants, and they hire people to mm. give them information. But uh, the World Health Organization, a lot of the policies come from the top down. They aren't coming from somebody who's an expert in the research and trying to give the best account of the science and then offering that up to uh, the, the policymakers. Often the policy is set by people who have an agenda or something mm -hmm. going on, and then that constrains or at least shapes or influences the work of the, the lower-level researchers who are actually physically typing up the report. Mm. And, uh, uh, you know, that, that's, that's another example I was just stunned to see when I started to look at the details. Now you said, you know, you're unsure, obviously, areas outside your expertise, what the what the status is of these, uh, if, if the same thing is going on. One of the things that I've um, realized, and I kind of had a, um, a disillusionment process before I went to college, I had this, I had the, the naive uh, view of higher education and academia. I thought it was all these brilliant people who were, you know, all innocently discovering truth and talking with one another. And I discovered something right. very different. Um, and this was confirmed not only while I was getting my undergrad, ed undergrad education, but I, I worked in the nonprofit sector for a while, engaged with a lot of professors, found that was the case. And the work that I'm doing now, I'm talking with professors all over the world. And I find oh, that that's my romantic vision was uh, misguided. But here's something. Now, this, this probably sounds crazy to you, but it, um, just like what if somebody's unaware of the state of, let's say, the replication crisis in psychology, the facts might sound crazy to them. But even in fields like mathematics, there are certain foundational claims that mathematicians have been making in for the last century, which I found are treated the exact same way which have become, uh, let's say, dogma or orthodoxy. It has to do with the theory of infinities. And I've spoken right. with, I don't know, probably six, six or seven um, different people who are either mathematicians or philosophers of mathematics who have said, who have shared their skepticism of the basic fundamental like axiomatic theory of infinities. Um, if all over the world, I, I, one from Ireland, uh, one from New Zealand, one from Australia, and then one from the United States, have all right. said, you know, there's room for skepticism here. But it, but in math of all areas, you know, you, because it's so um, logical, and it's, you know, if A, then B, if B, then C, if C, then D, and then they go on from there, the, that initial assumption, if A, then B, they think has already been established, or at least the formal mathematical orthodoxy thinks that it has been established, and you find there's actually room for skepticism. So I discovered this maybe, I don't know, two years ago, and I thought, this is... Right crazy to me of all the areas you'd think mathematics would be that which is immune from these kind of fundamental errors but it does not appear so yeah that doesn't surprise me at all but it's easy to see how this can happen any particular researcher can't reinvent the the wheel uh, right. you have to build on the work of others um, a lot of people aren't historically rooted in their discipline, so you often find that they're working on whatever is the latest thing um, that's going to be popular in their area. And so they work with their advisor, they know some of the latest stuff, um, but they, they might not actually go back and read those foundational papers that you know, were later sort of accepted, whether actively or passively, mm -hmm. and sort of, as you say, calcified into a dogma. There's certainly dogmas that exist throughout the sciences, as, as with any, any area of, of human thought. There's mm -hmm. political theories that uh, have calcified into dogmas. There's 
you know, uh, on the on the left and on the right, uh, politically, you find ideas that are very dogmatic, and uh, mm. uh, you know, uh, people take a lot of things for for granted. And and why? Because we have limited mental resources. So you you, have, you, you know, in, unless you're a, a genius and you have an infinity of time, you have to take a lot of things for granted. And and just that simple human fact and that human limitation makes it possible that things that maybe ought to be scrutinized more, or going back to fundamentals and basics. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes persist in the literature for for decades, and uh, you know only get rooted out under very unusual circumstances. Mm -hmm. And I think this is one of the areas where, as uh, you mentioned, you know the existence of the internet. I think in in many ways, the way that at least I would put it, is it perpetuate. As I love the internet, I think I mean I I wouldn't have a job if it weren't for the internet. I totally love right. the idea of the of the radical dissemination of information, but it does allow for. Um, let's say the the perpetuation of some very dogmatic thinking, uh, dogmatic ideas, the surface level research that one can just you know skim abstracts um, and not have a clue um, what what you're talking about, especially if you're working outside the field. But one of the benefits that has come from it, I think that will come from the new generation of intellectuals that are at least raised on the internet, is a is a more realistic and skeptical um, stance about some of the things we've been talking about where. I don't know prior to the internet how one would um, comfortably say something like, oh, I think some of the foundational theories in mathematics of all fields or science right. or psychology, I think some of these works that we hold up to be, you know, this is what we're building our knowledge on are wrong. And, I, and I, that to me gives me a, a bit of optimism that it's so much easier to encounter skeptical arguments now than it was just 20 years ago. My my favorite uh, book on this that everyone should read is called Are We All Scientific Experts Now by mm. the sociologist of science, uh, Harry Collins. It's mm. a short book. You can read it in a weekend, and it's just a brilliant discussion of the very sorts of things that we're talking about. But he talks about different levels of and kinds of expertise, and it certainly is possible that you can have people who weren't, in a sense, formally trained in the methods of a particular discipline who may, through their own extraordinary efforts, um, you know, gain a certain level of interactional expertise and, mm -hmm. and have some familiarity with the sorts of claims and theories and be able to make a skeptical uh, argument. I think sometimes this idea that unless you're a scientist, all your, all your possible logical inferences are somehow inferior. Mm -hmm. You know, scientists, scientists are better in that they've, they've trained for years and years to acquire certain specific skills. That's the sense in which they have a sort of epistemic authority with respect to certain claims. Mm -hmm. But scientists aren't necessarily better reasoners, for mm -hmm. example. Scientists aren't necessarily better moral philosophers or policy experts. And so sometimes you'll have scientists making these very uh, bold claims about, you know, the policies that they think obviously follows out of their scientific findings mm -hmm. or how you should behave or how you should accept this finding in your own life. Mm -hmm. Well, they're not experts in value claims. They're not experts in, in seeing entailments of ideas. I mean, they're probably better than the average person. So if you're a well-educated person who isn't an expert in a certain field, you know, the thought that somehow you should bow before the, 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 the statements of any scientist in an area that you're, you're skeptical about, I, I don't think that's right. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, scientists <laughs> do train for a lot of years to get highly difficult and uh, counterintuitive sets of, of, of skills that allow them to, you know, uh, uh, you know, have a, a genuine authority when it comes to certain types of claims. So mm -hmm. unfortunately, there's no easy answer here. This is why I, I loathe the you're either pro-science or anti-science discourse right. that comes out in the, the popular media where, you know, if you're on the left, you're like, oh, I'm pro-science. And then you say, so really, what can you explain this theory? And very often it's like, well, no, I don't actually understand how it works. I just know that I'm supposed to be pro-science because right. I'm part of this, you know, political group. Or, you know, uh, you're anti-science because you don't support this particular view. You know, there's some research on this where, you know, on climate change, for example, regardless of your of your view uh, in, in, in the public, whether you're sort of pro or anti or skeptical or whatever it is, you, you, you tend to have similar levels of actual understanding of the theory. Mm. So it's not that you know what's going on and that's <laughs> why you support the theory. It's that you know you're supposed to support the theory. Mm. Again, I'm not making any comment at all on the science of climate science. I'm mm -hmm. not an expert in that area, so I completely leave that to others. Um, but but again, this idea that you can just cast aspersions on on people as being in one camp or the other is not the way it goes. Yes. Um, it just give, give give one example here. And during the AIDS crisis in in the 80s, um, there were the you know the doctors wanted to do a randomized control trials so they could test the efficacy of different drugs. And a lot of gay men who were dying said, listen, I don't want to be in the placebo arm of this trial. I just want the drug if you have a theoretical reason for thinking mm -hmm. it would work prior to actually getting the right kind of evidence. And at that time, there was a lot more medical authoritarianism where the doctor said, we know best and you're mm -hmm. out there and we're going to do our science and you're going to give us our data. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these men were so concerned about their mortality that they essentially became experts in the literature. A lot of them 
uh, learned as much as they possibly could, came to understand the theories, read the articles as they came out, pointed out flaws in some of the science and so on. Really? So it's, it's certainly possible that lay people who are sufficiently motivated and, and care about the topic can in some cases uh, you know, acquire a certain type of skepticism that's, that's justified and that indeed should be taken account of by the people in the white lab coats. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, there are a lot of people who are total crackpots, and they read a study once somewhere that, and they don't really know how to evaluate it, and they, you know, the study's been discredited, but they still keep bringing it up. Um, that that is a just a vast and serious problem as well. And 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 again, the only thing there, as I can tell, is to to help people be better reasoners and to know when and under what conditions it's appropriate to be skeptical, when mm-hmm. and under what conditions it's appropriate to rely on the authority of someone else. Um, we can't all be experts in every topic, unfortunately, and that mm-hmm. means we have to rely on trust. We have to rely on authority in certain cases, and uh, and so we have to pick and choose our battles. Um, but we should be cautious about asserting that we know something because we, you know, read an article online once, mm-hmm. or we we fancy ourselves to be skeptics. Um, that's not the way to go either, and and uh, you have to skate between these extremes. Yeah, uh, it's. I mean, you you put it wonderfully, and I can certainly personally attest to the fact, given that in my own project, I'm I'm playing this line between talking with a bunch of people inside the system, criticizing lots of parts of the system from outside the system. And uh, as a result of that, I found I get a lot of, um, let's just say, a, a lot of communication and emails from people that are legitimate, legitimate crackpots. Uh, and it's true. Yeah, it's out oh, there. Totally. There's, a, there's a lot of, there's plenty of justified room for skepticism, especially as if you dive into some area that you're interested in, most likely you'll find there's a lot more room for skepticism than you thought when you weren't aware of the area. But sure yeah. enough, uh, uh, there are the, the majority of people that I have been contacted by, I would say, um, yeah. who, who are interested maybe in my skeptical positions, you know, on mathematics are legitimately crackpots. So the, they're the, there is uh, a reason perhaps for the stigma, even though it's, I think it is, um, I think it has, turns into factions, right? You have the people inside the system who are the brilliant scientists. You have the crackpots outside the system as if those are the only yeah. two options. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I mean, we haven't emphasized this uh, part of the conversation as much because I, you know, part of what I, my role in the scientific community here is that I've been talking a lot about the, the problems and the flaws. Mm-hmm. And I've been emphasizing those things because I think that they're not talked about enough. But we could equally have spent an hour talking about the problems with pseudoscience, with mm-hmm. crackpots, with people raising harmful theories that they don't have sufficient support for, mm-hmm. uh, for people, you know, not sufficiently trusting uh, scientific uh, evidence that is indeed well substantiated. Um, so that's the other side of this coin, of course. Uh, mm-hmm. It's just that, like you've just said, it, people use these proxies. You know, if somebody has a lot of letters after their name, people get excited about that and they say, well, that person must be, must be you know, properly uh, accredited and know what they're talking about. Right. And, and for the most part, that is a reliable proxy. If you have spent years educating yourself at the top universities, it's, it's very likely that you know more about what you're talking about if it's within your area of expertise than other people. That's generally a reliable proxy. But of course, sometimes people have letters after the names and they get things wrong. Mm-hmm. And we have to be open to that possibility. Similarly, you know, generally speaking, if you're just kind of fishing around the internet and trying to come up with some theory, you know, confirmation bias is a huge force uh, in, in our lives. It's easy to, to click around on the internet and if I'm sort of inclined toward conspiracy theories or something like this and I say, well, the man is out to get me and, you know, I can't trust authorities, you can, you can find, you know, um, illegitimate support for that view with a few clicks on the internet mm-hmm. very easily and, mm-hmm. and, and that shouldn't be given uh, any credence at all. So, um, you know, uh, p- p- we, we all should be trying to counteract our own biases. We all should be trying to adopt a skeptical stance, not just toward the man or, uh, you know, those skeptics over there, but toward our own ideas. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, you should, we should be skeptical of our own skepticism. If we find that we're just, you know, throwing stones at everybody else's theory, but we're not constructively offering our own point of view, mm-hmm. or if we're, you know, not charitably construing what the other person's trying to get at and we're just trying to tear them down, uh, that's that's misguided as well. Mm-hmm. And, and so, like I say, there's no shortcut or easy heuristic here. People have to try to, to, to keep their biases in check. They have to learn about what sorts of biases we all have and figure out strategies. You know, there are various rationalist movements and things that go around meetup groups where people try to, you know, identify biases and counteract them and so on. Um, but uh, but we should we should be aware when we're using a proxy for something. When we're mm-hmm. using, you know, um, a, a, a degree as a proxy for truth, 
We just have to recognize it's a proxy. It's maybe a good heuristic, but it's not infallible. Similarly, mm-hmm. somebody who's not educated in a proper way, that doesn't mean they're wrong, but they're, they're more likely to be wrong than mm-hmm. someone who spent 10 years you know, acquiring the proper tools to know how to evaluate the literature. And, mm-hmm. you know, and so we have to treat it for what it is, which is a heuristic that often fails. I mean, that very well put. So the last question I want to ask you is about peer review. This is one of those right. buzzwords that gets thrown around in the media all the time that uh, right. scientists throw it around all the time. And it's supposed to immediately give this feeling of oh, legitimacy, oh, p- professionalism, oh, truth, when you drop the words right. peer review. So we have peer review in theory. Can you tell me a bit about peer review in practice? Is peer review what people make it out to be? as this this marker of when you get the stamp of peer review, that means, oh, well, the, this is practically truth. <laughs> right. Okay. This is a complicated subject, and I'll, I'll try to touch on a few main points. Um, peer review, this is sort of like the quote about Winston Churchill earlier. Um, it certainly is better to have your manuscript rigorously reviewed by a genuine peer Mm-hmm. And particularly if you're talking about a top journal, typically those editors are very good about trying to select people who will uh, give a very serious scrutiny of your paper before it's it's published. That doesn't mm-hmm. guarantee that what you've published is reliable, but when peer review is working properly, it is indeed a very important quality control mechanism. Mm-hmm. The problem is the difference between theory and practice. In some cases, peer review works and it helps and it filters out some of the bad stuff. But there's a couple issues here. One, there's a proliferation of these open access journals that are, are so-called predatory journals. There are some quality open access journals, and there are some that are set up in remote areas of China with addresses and vague places and made up editorial boards that will print anything that they get, and, and they'll just take author's fees. And so they, that, those are not you know, adequately peer-reviewed in any way. That's mm-hmm. just basically academic fraud. Um, so that's a problem. You might have a paper that looks like it's in a, a, a you know, a, a real journal, but it's 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 just nonsense that somebody published in one of these uh, predatory journals. Mm-hmm. And then there's this gray area in the middle, <clears throat> which is that peer review in practice has uh, lots of problems. Uh, I'll just name a few of them. Richard Smith, who used to be the editor of uh, the British Medical Journal, the BMJ, a very influential journal, was very concerned to figure out how reliable peer review was. I mean, the thing about science that's fun is you can apply science to the process of science. Mm -hmm. You can say, well, let's do a study on the efficacy of peer review. And so one way of doing this, quite simply, is to take a manuscript, embed lots of errors in it, and send it out to the (laughs) the sorts of peer reviewers who would typically handle it and see how many of them notice the errors. And very often you find that they don't. The rate of, of error catching is disturbingly low. Here's another issue about peer review. Um, I, I've been a, an associate editor for different journals or a guest editor, and so I've had the, the, the position of receiving a manuscript, and then I'm the one who decides who do I send this out to. You know, mm. I've got to find the peer reviewers. So, so I've, I have a kind of inside look at what this is like. Well, when I read the paper, if it, particularly if it's in a contentious area, I'm, I'm going to form a judgment about it right away. And it's not that I have some sort of dispassionate algorithm that I go use to help me select the most qualified reviewers who don't have a stake in the game or something like that. I, I make a judgment. If I think that the paper really shouldn't be published, whether I'm doing this consciously or unconsciously, I'm more likely to pick a peer reviewer that I have a good hunch is going to sink the paper mm. because I kind of know what they would argue about this case. Mm. Or I kind of know that they would say that the, you know, these methods aren't sufficient to prove the point. Whereas if I like the paper and it's, it, I, I think it's something that should be published, mm-hmm. again, there's, there's not some magical objective formula that takes place here, but I'm going to send it to somebody who I think will give the paper its best shot. So this is just an example of the decision-making that goes on in associate editors' minds. Now, again, associate editors at good journals that have good reputations for good reason really try to do their best to get you know, maybe one review from somebody who's likely to be sympathetic to the article, another one from somebody who's likely to be critical. Then they try to synthesize between these different things and really come up with a, a well-informed judgment about whether they should or shouldn't publish the paper. So that's the ideal scenario, and that does happen. And again, part of what the trick is going to be going forward is helping people identify which journals are indeed uh, uh, using good practices, mm. which journals are having a rigorous uh, peer review process that really is a, a good quality control mechanism. So I don't want to suggest that it doesn't exist, but I do want to suggest that there's a lot of room for politicking in, in mm. peer review, um, where especially when you're in a politicized area, uh, you know, if the, if the associate editor of the journal has a certain attitude, they know who they can call up for a, a peer review. Um, it's 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 not done uh, in any sort of purely dispassionate way. I don't even know how it would be done in such mm-hmm. a way. Um, so so just because something's got a, a stamp of peer review, uh, that that again is it's it's a piece of information. Um, if a, if if a paper is peer reviewed at a really good journal, 
and that journal has a good track record of publishing stuff that sort of bears out over time, then I maybe give a little more credence to the fact that it was peer-reviewed at that journal. Mm -hmm. Um, But I shouldn't just take the mere fact of something being peer-reviewed as evidence that it's therefore true or that it's passed some really strict test of, of reliability because extremely often that is not the case and something can be peer reviewed and uh, you know basic errors will slip through for example peer reviewers don't don't check the statistics uh, of authors so they 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 just don't have the time they, and they also don't read every reference uh, uh, included in the reference section right how could because you? Uh, peer reviewers aren't paid to do this it's all done as a favor to the sort of academic community and so if somebody sends a peer reviewer a manuscript and it's uh, 50 pages long and there's 100 references um, they're just trusting the author to have cited references that are the appropriate citations that sufficiently support the claim. Mm. Now, if you're a specific expert in a specific area, you'll be able to identify whether the references are the right references or not. But very often, peer reviewers are sort of a little bit more generally knowledgeable about the field, but they may not know the specific issue, mm-hmm. and, and they're sort of giving it a, a, a quality check uh, to the best of their ability, but they might miss these sorts of things, particularly if somebody has an agenda and they're submitting papers and using citations improperly. Uh, which does occur. Um, similarly, there's, in almost no cases do they rerun the statistics. Uh, mm-hmm. So they just take the statistics at face value. They hope that the researchers have done due diligence. And what they're looking for is sort of obvious signs of design flaws or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and they may very well catch them. And, and in many cases, properly uh, motivated peer reviewers do a very good job of saying this paper just shouldn't be published. It's not rigorous. Um, the paper might then go on to be published in, in a, a so-called lower ranked journal. So just because it's rejected at a top journal doesn't mean it's not going to be published elsewhere. Mm-hmm very often with the very same flaws. So, you know, and that would count as a quote-unquote peer-reviewed paper, even though the first person who maybe was the real expert said it shouldn't be published. Mm. So that happens all the time. You know, if I put in all the effort to uh, put a manuscript together just because it got rejected at the top journal doesn't mean I'm not going to file it away. I'm going to keep going down the totem pole until I find a journal that accepts it. Now, hopefully I've taken the criticism and tried to improve it and so on. But many authors don't do that. They just go down the line and wait till somebody accepts it, um, flaws and all. And, and that happens, uh, again, all the time. Now, do you think there's should be something like um, getting compensated for professional peer review? Do you think that would correct some of the, the problems? Peer review has to be revolutionized. Uh, peer review is, is uh, on balance, an extremely unreliable quality control mechanism right now, again, with lots of exceptions and you know some people doing good work. But on the whole, peer review, uh, first of all, it's very slow. So if I have a paper and I'm, you know, I'm, an, I'm an expert in the area, I've actually done good work, I'm pretty sure I've done good work, and then I submit it to the journal and it gets held up for six months when really – it, you know, people should be able to see that and use that. So authors are now doing things where they'll put what are called preprints of their papers on certain repositories. Mm-hmm. So while it's being reviewed, they have a draft of it that's available. Mm-hmm. So it's not it's not reviewed yet, but other people in the community can just decide whether it's useful. You know, they don't need to have those two reviewers that some associate editor happened to find were available that week to mm-hmm. do the review. Um, and then maybe they're on vacation, so they give it to the graduate student to do or something, which again happens regularly. So, um, you know, the fact that the two people that you manage to get to do the paper are somehow the be-all and end-all arbiters of whether it's a good paper, <laughs> that's crazy. If you, if you put it in an online uh, uh, venue, you, you can let the community decide. They can read the paper and see if there are any flaws. If you had, you know, 150 eyes on your paper rather than two eyes, um, that's, that's going to be much more likely to, to give you valuable feedback, and people mm-hmm. are going to be able to say, listen, why did you run that test instead of that test? Or show me your open data so that I can rerun these statistics. Or mm-hmm. you know, here's a way you could improve your argument in this passage. So, so something more like crowdsource peer review among mm-hmm. you know, experts who cross a certain threshold of qualification to be able to comment on a paper or something like that uh, is where the future is going to be. Because the idea that, that two people should be the deciders in chief of every paper that comes out just creates a huge bottleneck and completely mm-hmm. slows science down, sometimes years. Um, and I think that's also completely unacceptable. That's excellent. Uh, I love that idea. I think that's a beautiful blending of the internet, the, the pros of the internet, um, with the new intellectual system that I hope emerges taking advantage of these technologies, because you've, you've brought up excellent points. I mean, bottom line is skepticism is justified. The world of ideas is really hard to navigate. <laughs> Yeah. humans, scientists are all humans, the professionals are all humans. Yeah, and again, we have to look around at the success stories of science, too. We're, we've focused completely on the flaws and, and so on in this in this uh, conversation, which, mm-hmm. again, I think is an important conversation to have. Mm-hmm. But if you look around the world around us and you look at the feats of engineering and you look at the discoveries that have been made and the diseases that have been eradicated, no one could deny mm-hmm. uh, that the, the scientific method when properly applied and over given enough time and weeding out the errors and so on has uh, tra- completely transformed uh, human existence. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, sometimes in dangerous ways with the inventions of bombs and things like that, but other other times in in uh, very beneficial ways. And mm-hmm. so, you know, science works a lot. 
Um, but sometimes it stumbles, and we need mm-hmm. to be honest about the ways it stumbles so that we can fix those problems rather than sweep them under the rug. That's an excellent note to end on. Thank you so much for this conversation. This has really been fantastic. Yeah, thanks for your time. This was a lot of fun for me as well. All right, that was my interview with Mr. Brian Earp. I hope you guys enjoyed it even a tenth as much as I enjoyed it. In the modern world, this kind of criticism is frankly taboo, and it shouldn't be, and we need a lot more of it. It is okay. You have intellectual permission to be skeptical about everything, even those sacred cows like the scientific process in practice. Like I said at the beginning of the show, if you valued this episode and you want to hear more interviews like it, head over to patreon.com slash Steve Patterson. And make sure to tune in next week as I'll be interviewing a very special guest, J.P. Sears. He's the man who's become famous for his ultra-spiritual videos where he kind of satirizes the New Age movement. Well, it turns out he's not just a satirist. He's also a serious life coach who actually believes many of the things that he criticizes. He's actually a really interesting guy, so I'm sure you guys are going to love that interview. All right, that's all for me today. Have a fantastic week. Fantastic week. Fantastic week. Fantastic week. Fantastic week. Fantastic week.